on 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13, which is the anointing of David. And we can see that this is this has to happen, or it's going to happen because Saul uh, failed at uh, his uh, duties as king. So, I have a quick story here for you guys. I, for some reason, seem to do a lot on Teddy Roosevelt. I'll just think that now. Um, but during one of his political campaigns, a delegation called on Teddy Roosevelt at his home in Oyster Bay, Long Island. The president met them with a coat, with his coat off and his sleeves rolled up. He said, he said to them, come down to the barn and we will talk while I do some work. <coughs> at the barn, Roosevelt picked up a pitchfork and looked around for the hay. Then he called out to his, uh, to, I guess to his servant, John, where's all the hay? Sorry, sir, John called down from the hayloft. I ain't had time to toss it back down again since uh, the last time you were in Iowa with the folks there. So hopefully you found there that uh, Roosevelt was just putting on a, an appearance to um, seem like he was working really hard and when the right people were on him. Or maybe you're like um, maybe you're like my cousin. Uh, on the pe this past uh, Sunday we went over to uh, my uncle's house and there was three different uh, birthdays that we were celebrating. They were all, they were all close together. Um, before we left, though, before we left my house, um, my mom was like, I want, I want a picture with all the grandchildren before we leave. Um, and my, uh, my cousin, uh, Jenna, she's like, well, I need, I need to go get ready first. Like, for this one picture, I need to go get ready. I'm thinking to myself, like, this is, this is like absolutely ridiculous. Like, why well, I need to go get ready for this, for one picture. Um, but thankfully, you know, she didn't actually go get ready. We were just taking one uh, picture. I know that it sometimes ends up being like an album because everybody takes, you know, like 10 figures when they say they're only going to take one. But she was very persistent in the fact that she thought that she needed to go get, get ready just for this one, just for this one picture. So, as you can tell by these two stories, uh, this morning's lesson is going to be on appearances. But... I think there's more to it, and hopefully you guys will see, than just making sure that you don't care that much about how you look. I think there's more to the story than that. So, as I mentioned, uh, today's uh, message will be in 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13. So if you guys can turn there if you would like, or flip to it, whatever, on your phone. Um, and as you guys are looking, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, from the previous chapter and then some of the context in the in the following chapter. So in chapter 15, as I said, Paul was rejected um, as king by by the Lord. Um, and specifically, he was supposed to um, go and attack the Amicalites and totally destroy all that belonged to him. So specifically, um, in verse 3 it said, now go and attack the Amicalites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put to death men, women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul did not listen to what the, the Lord had, had to say about this. He kept one of the kings of the Amicalites and he kept and saved the cattle that he deemed good. Um, then Samuel was then used as a prophet to tell what the Lord uh, had to say to Saul now that he disobeyed him. It was like a strike three. This is not the first like, it's offense that that Saul, that Saul did. Uh, so, although we're not going to get specifically into this, uh, the Lord says that he regrets putting uh, Saul as king. Does anybody know where else in the Old Testament where uh, the Lord says, I, I regret doing something? There's only one other time. Does anybody remember? And it's very early on. For all the Bible brownie points in the room. Go ahead. Oh, geez. Oh, um, I want to say, like, Noah. You're basically correct. Well, what specifically? Yeah, well, yeah, like, I, I, I like, know it's like, I feel like, <laughs> oh, shoot. It was. It was, like, like right, right where, like, the, he was like, announcing the flood to Noah and stuff, like, building the ark and yeah. stuff. I don't want to say he, like he regretted like, not making man, but like something like that man was doing that he regret. Well, he he, he did did regret making man because of the um, evil that, that that was in the world. So yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, so if we continue uh, in the context, 
of uh, chapter 16, right after this, um, I'm going to be leading up to this or hinting at this, uh, David shows why he was anointed as king. He then goes into Saul's service uh, as an evil, as uh, the spirit of the Lord had left him, and an evil spirit had come to torment him. So you'll probably learn about that more uh, next week. So hopefully you guys now are at uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, and I'll read that for you right now. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, and be on your way. I send you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will certainly kill me. The Lord said, Take a, a, a heifer, which is just a cow, with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel and Eliab uh, thought that surely the Lord's anointed stands before, before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesus said to Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Because he had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel says, The Lord has not chosen these. So he, so, uh, he, um, sorry. So Jesse asked, are, so or excuse me. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons that you have? They're still the youngest. Jesse answered, He's tending to the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down before until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearances and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint, anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel then went on to Ramah. So, as we can see in verse 1, Samuel is mourning the downfall of Saul. Um, the Lord here is talking to Samuel through what most people believe is like a dream or a vision. And the Lord, he doesn't get upset at the fact that uh, Samuel is mourning over this. He's just um, upset with the fact that uh, there's nothing that uh, you can do anymore for Saul. The things that he has brought on himself are ir irreversible um, and ultimately God's will will be done anyway so he was simply upset the fact that he was mourning too long and then in verse or continuing in verse 1 it says to uh, fill your, your horn with oil and go anoint the next king um, so we see here in the picture so this was, this was the horn that he was uh, supposed to go anoint uh, David with it's different than these type, which they're called a, a, a phenol, phenol, P H I L A I L A L. There you go. Um, th and that was what uh, Saul was anointed with. And the reason for this, this type, was it was supposed to show uh, the abundance of gifts bestowed upon David and the firmness and duration of how long the kingdom was going to be. So John Gill, who um, as you guys probably know by now, I, I've used him a lot um, in my lessons and stuff. He says that, however, God had his own mind uh, set and picked out uh, David, whom he would hereafter make known. This was the king for himself, raised up to fulfill his will. Saul was chosen by him, but then it was at the request of the people, and so he was rather their king than his. But this was not at their desire, nor with their knowledge but of his own good will and pleasure. One was given in wrath, and the other one was given in love. So this is just mainly saying that the Lord had set out and 
already had um, determined who was going to be the next king. And as you guys know, it's, it's David, and this line would ultimately produce the Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 2, we see how dangerous uh, choosing a new king can be, as Saul was so concerned and still clinging to, to the throne and would not let go. And Samuel was sure that Saul was going to kill him. You see that there in verse 2, which argues the weakness of faith that Samuel had at that moment, fearing man and not fearing what the, what the Lord could do. The Lord then tells uh, Samuel to essentially go to Bethlehem, hold a worship service, and then invite Jesse and his family to attend. And they were to partake in the peace offering that, that uh, he was showing. Then if we move down to uh, verse 4, we see now that Samuel did, did exactly what the Lord said. But a um, really interesting part here is that the elders of the town trembled when they met him. So this is just saying like when he, Samuel now was, uh, was a very older man, and when older men would walk around, that's not something that you necessarily see. Um, if that happened, it was probably something very important or uh, you, the town or the city was, was in trouble. Uh, as he was a product from the Lord, possibly um, coming to reprove them or to uh, denounce and give judgment for something that they had done. But as you see, he actually uh, came in peace. And um, Samuel wasn't exactly doing this. He wasn't exactly coming to judge uh, Bethlehem. But uh, he had to come because of the sins that Saul and therefore... Uh, the judgment that was now on Saul due to the rejection of him being his king. So in verse 5, as we continue, Saul explains how he came in peace, or excuse me, Samuel explains how he came in peace, and he told Jesse and his sons to come and consecrate themselves. So um, you might not understand what consecrate means, and sometimes we just like gloss over it, um, but some versions of the um, Bible say sanctify, which that, that may help. But consecration essentially meant to prepare yourselves uh, for the sacrifice or the offering that was going to happen. So this was done by washing the garments and helping the person that offered the peace offering set up everything, set up um, what was needed for the offering to occur. And sometimes um, this, this word is used in uh, communion to show that the uh, bread and wine represent the uh, body and blood of Christ. So, as we move on then, we see that in verse 7, this is the, um, but we see that in verse 7 that this is when the anointing of David starts to begin. But, um, and this is where I really want to hone in on, and this is where the main point of the message uh, comes about. But we see that, um, Eliab, who was called Elihu sometimes, was born, was the firstborn of Jesse, and he came up to present himself uh, as the firstborn, and Samuel still said that he was not the one that the Lord had chosen. Probably many people think because of he had uh, evil thoughts, he was prideful, his heart was not right before the Lord, and that's exactly what uh, verse 7 says, and I'll read that again. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I rejected him. The Lord does not look at the thing people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So he was not to consider his appearance, his stature. His stature is probably, um, he didn't look like Saul, but the same type of physical features that put Saul um, in, in a place as king. So man only sees what is without but the Lord sees what is specifically within, within your heart. Only the outward, excuse me, only the outward visible form of the body is seen by man, but the inward qualifications and the endowments or the, char or the character of the person of the mind are seen by the Lord. So man only sees the height, his looks, um, how he might uh, seem very deemable to be, to be king. But the Lord looks at the quality of the heart, the person's character. So the Lord knows what is in the heart, um, prudence, justice, integrity, mercy, goodness, that would qualify someone 
to be to be king. So if we continue to move on now to verse eight and nine, we see that two more, the second and third oldest sons, uh, Jesse, come and talk talk to Samuel, hoping that they would be anointed as king. But both of them were not qualified and did not prevail. Then we see in verse ten how some uh, some hope seems to be lost from Samuel as he asks Jesse if this is. <laughs> This is all the sons that he has. Um, but he mentions that he has one more, and that is David. And Jesse mentioned that he was the youngest one, the only one left, but he wasn't even actually at the, the offering. He was out tending sheep. A messenger was then sent uh, to go and get David, and they would actually not sit down to eat before he actually arrived. So I thought I saw that I, as ironic. They didn't even seen him uh, worthy enough to actually invite him, but then by the time the messenger went out and got him, they were not going to sit down till he came back. So they must have seen, saw him then, like a quick change of events of him worthy enough for them not to even sit down and start their, start their meal and offering before uh, he even came. So it mentions that David has all the right physical features, but as the um, as a shepherd, we know that uh, the profession of shepherd really wasn't like high up. It was very a smelly job. Um, he was probably very uh, sweating. He was red, red cheek by the time that that he came. He's probably all you know, hair messed up, whatever, because uh, he had to come at a moment's notice. But some of his delightful features, behold, that 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 he held, carry the sweetness as well as the majesty that was ultimately a type of Christ, which um, we can kind of see in Song of Solomon 510, um, something that you guys can look at uh, on your own, but I just think that important there to, uh, to mention. The Lord then told Samuel that David is the one that they should be anointing. Um, and there was no, there was no uh, time in between immediately once that happened, once the Lord uh, spoke to Samuel Immediately, David was anointed. So, finally, we see in verse 13 that when he was anointed, he took the horn, which was specifically uh, instructed by the Lord to do, and he anointed him. Uh, when he anointed him, it was not done in the midst of all his brothers. Um, it does say in the presence, so that just means that um, they, they probably knew that it was going, something was going on, but they didn't know specifically what was what was happening. So most likely just Jesse and Samuel were in the in the room or in the in the area with them. This happened because it would not have been uh, consistent with the secrecy in which um, Samuel was told to uh, direct this affair. So and it was also necessary as we see uh, in ver in chapter seventeen that the lead treatment of David afterwards would have never would, would have been different uh, if we would have addressed the fact uh, that he's being anointed as king, and this was also probably done because Saul said they were worried that Saul would somehow find out and try to go and kill him. So once this happens, we see the spirit of the Lord actually enter enter Samuel, and uh, as we continue, then by next week in verse fourteen, we see that the spirit of the Lord uh, departed Saul, um, and we see why. Like I said, why uh, he was anointed as king? One of the reasons why uh, was because he brought comfort and a sense of calmness to Saul after the spirit of the Lord departed him, and an evil spirit came and tormented him. He played his he played his harp for him to, to soothe him. So this spirit, uh, people think, had a couple of characteristics to it. Um, it was uh, it particularly showed itself in music and in poetry, and that can definitely be seen in Psalms, um, as David wrote a lot of those mainly um, in Psalm form, I guess you could say. Um, this is also a spirit of wisdom and prudence uh, with sacred things, so wisdom and knowledge to know what to do with sac uh, sacred uh, rituals and things like that. And finally, it was also a spirit that brought about uh, fortitude, which basically just means it showed itself the strength of body, um, and courage, and 
that was shown uh, in the next chapter as well with David and Goliath, how all the all the Israelites were were quaking and weren't they were afraid of, the, of this nine foot giant, but David, having the spirit of the Lord in him, had the courage and knew that he could ultimately uh, conquer this giant. You can also probably see it in the lion and the bear uh, that he was able to uh, kill and and save himself from through the power of the Lord. Um, but as we move on, uh, David said to Saul when um, he was about to fight David and Goliath, he said, let no one lose heart on account of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight for him. And Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of his and of, the, of this Philistine. Saul then said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So that was in 1 Samuel 17 and 32 through 33 and verse 37. So we see that the majority of the time we often make uh, the problems that we have, the problems that we face, bigger problems than, than they really are, bigger problems than they actually need to be, causing us to have un, unrealistic uh, judgments. Um, so we need not necessarily to fear others. Uh, we do not need to compete as God sees the uh, beauty in us that is more than just uh, skin deep. So that leads into what I want you guys to mainly take um, from this passage. And the first thing is that the Lord sees into my heart. Now, as I just said, God sees uh, the beauty in, beauty in us that's more than uh, skin deep, but that can also kind of bring a worriness in a way to us because Jesus talks about in Mark 7 20 through uh, 23 what the heart really is filled with and it says that what comes out of the man man's heart is what makes him unclean for within from within out from excuse me for from within out of a man's heart comes evil thoughts sexual immorality theft murder adultery greed malice, deceit, luridness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from the inside and make a man unclean. So we see then uh, what, what our heart ultimately is. Though. And we, can't, we can't ultimately fool God. We, he sees right past the appearance or the front that, that, that we might put up. Uh, Pastor Douglas, this guy has a weird last name, but it's Hog, Hogland. And he says that he knows all the thoughts and desires which race and rage within. That's a frightening thought, and yet it's a healing, healing one as well. For when I stop trying to cover up all my sins and, and defects with a good-looking exterior, when I stop denying my problems and get honest about them, when I ask God to help me clean, clean out my heart, then a new life can begin. I no longer need to please, please others in order to feel good about myself. God's Spirit comes upon me and lives in me just as it did with David. So then number two, the Lord sees what my heart can be and can become in his hands. What the Lord did, or what the Lord did, and he ultimately saw in David's heart um, what what was good, what was um, he had his his heart right before the Lord. And David uh, knew that in order for anything to happen, he had a willingness to submit and surrender to the heart of the Lord. David placed his whole life in, in God's hands. David knows that he cannot put the emptiness in his heart by simply just pleasing people. Only God can fill him with love and make and make him whole. And in God's hands, that that small shepherd boy uh, becomes the greatest king of Israel and the ancestor of Jesus, the Savior and the King of the world. And if we want any evidence of this, just look in, um, in, in the Psalms as, uh, like I said before, he gives uh, many uh, songs of praise, also songs of um, when he's going through hard times, but songs of praise about what, what the Lord has done and, and who he is and the characteristics of him. Uh, this, this point leads into what I said before about how the main the main point of that of this message was in um, uh, verse seven, 
what um, what it truly means for us and why I think this this verse in particular is so important. If we if we before we look at that again, if we go back to when Jesus uh, was riding in uh, on Palm Sunday, the crowd was yelling, "Hosanna to the Son of David!" Blessed is the coming kingdom of our Father David. They assume Jesus will be the will be a king like David. He'll wage war, conquer lands, pillar foes, and purge evil. And they were and they were right. And Jesus does come to rule and to reign as our king. They were right when they shouted, "Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." They were right when they cried, "Hosanna!" because it means to save us. But they were also wrong in terms of uh, where the where the the battlefield is where they're where they're fighting, or where, where where he's fighting for us. It's not the outside that needs to be fought, but Jesus knew that it was the inside. The battle is in the valley of the shadow of death that lies lies with, within us, within our heart. The battle is against that that very sin that's in our heart. The evil in our hearts cannot be taken away based off of anything that we do, and I think most of you guys understand that. But David himself knows, knows this too when he says in the Psalms, Create in me a pure heart, O God. David understands that the battle uh, is, is from within. And Jesus, our King, came to uh, save us, specifically from us. He came to save us from us. This is where the story of uh, the anointing of David is heading. It does not matter you know, what, what you look like, where you've been, or what you've done. Jesus looks into the heart. He longs to clean out whatever sin is buried deep down within and fill you with a love that ultimately never lets go. So the only question really is, who is your king? Will you follow the king of outward appearances? Will you follow the king of shadow fades and temporary trends? Or will you surrender and follow king? Will you surrender and follow Jesus? Will you place your heart in his hands? So to close out here, I have um, a short little video to kind of mix it up. It is it is a little bit cheesy, and it's, uh, you guys are feel feel free to laugh. But I know that probably by the end of it, you're gonna remember it, and it's probably gonna be stuck in your head. So let me clean that up real quick. Just basically a song, but
safety as as they uh, go home, but also give uh, either Pastor Jeff or, Pastor, or, or uh, Pastor Jace the words to say as they come and speak to us later. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do and what you will, and what you will continue to do in us. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> 